Science is often intentional. The Higgs boson particle, for example, is a particle that gives elementary particles their mass. Elementary particles are particles that are not made up of anything else. So for example, quarks, the particles that make up protons and neutrons, and leptons are all elementary particles and they get their mass from their interaction with the Higgs field, with these Higgs bosons. So on July 4th, 2012, when scientists at CERN turned on the Large Hadron Collider, they were intentionally looking for the Higgs boson. They had a theory and they wanted to prove that this theory was right. So they designed an experiment and they built a machine capable of testing this theory. And they found it. So they set out to find it and they found it. But sometimes science is accidental. We discover something when we're looking for something else or we discover something completely by accident when we weren't even looking for anything at all. This is a story of one of those times. The accidental discovery I want to talk to you about today is responsible for saving tens of millions of lives. So back in 1889, two German doctors, Oskar Minkowski and Joseph von Mehring, wanted to test the already established hypothesis that the pancreas had something to do with digestion. And so they took a laboratory dog and they removed its pancreas. And shortly after the surgery, they noticed that the dog's urine was attracting flies. And when they tested it, they noticed that the urine was loaded with sugar. They'd inadvertently given the dog diabetes. Now, humans have known about diabetes for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians in 1500 BC identified it by people who would lose a ton of weight or urinate a lot. And they discussed it in the Ebers Papyrus, which is an ancient Egyptian papyrus on medical and herbal knowledge. And ancient Indians, thanks to doctors like Shushruta, would identify diabetes by a term madumeha, which means honey like urine or honey like water. So what they would do is they would look to see if people's urine would attract ants. That would tell them that their urine was sweet and therefore it had a lot of sugar in it, which means that they had diabetes. Now, that's not the only way they identified if people's urine was sweet. They also tasted it. They tasted it. Now, you might hate your job right now, but at least your job isn't tasting urine all day. <laughs> or maybe you'd prefer that. I don't know you, but that doesn't sound great to me. <laughs> Egyptian and Indian cultures were not the only ones to identify diabetes. Greeks, Chinese, Koreans, Persians, tons of cultures around the world identified this disease. And also ancient Indians were not the only ones testing it by tasting urine. This was a really quick and popular way to identify if someone had diabetes because their urine would taste very sweet because of the high glucose content in the urine. Interestingly, Shushruta also noted that diabetes rates were much higher in those of the upper caste that had access to excess foods and often ate foods like rice, cereals, and sweets a lot more often than people in lower castes. Which is really interesting because that's the kind of food that diabetics have to watch and monitor and be careful how much they consume. Before the discovery of insulin, the diagnosis of diabetes was essentially a death sentence. There was nothing doctors could do to treat it. They didn't even know what was causing it, let alone how to treat it. And so what doctors often did is they would prescribe people specific diets and that might buy them maybe a couple months, maybe a year, but that's all it was doing. It was just buying them a little bit of time. It wasn't actually solving the problem. And in fact, sometimes it was creating the problem because sometimes doctors would prescribe low calorie diets, something like 400 calories a day. And that would often lead to people starving to death rather than dying from their diabetes. And so this was a horrible disease. I mean, it still is, but back then it was even worse where there was just no good outcome. If you were diagnosed with diabetes, it was fatal, for sure. So that's why the Minkowski and von Mehring discovery where they accidentally gave a dog diabetes by removing its pancreas was such an important one. It was a breakthrough in science because now we finally knew that there was some sort of link between the pancreas and diabetes. We didn't know what it was, but there was something there. And so that started off a mad rush of scientists and researchers over the next 30 years trying desperately to figure out that link. What's that link between the pancreas and diabetes? They didn't know about it initially, but what these scientists were desperately trying to find was insulin. The next big breakthrough in the search for insulin was by Paul Langerhans who discovered that there was a special part of the pancreas later called the islets of Langerhans that were responsible for producing insulin. But the problem was he didn't know how to extract the insulin. No one did. The next big challenge was actually figuring out okay how do we extract the insulin from these islets of Langerhans? In fact, the extraction of insulin was such a challenging process that many scientists were just starting to give up, thinking it was impossible to do. But then in 1920, on October 31st, 
a young Canadian physician, Frederick Banting, who had been following this medical research on pancreas and insulin connection, had an idea and he wrote down, Diabetes. Ligate pancreatic ducts of dogs. Keep dogs alive till a cine degenerate. Then try to isolate internal secretions of these to relieve glycosuria. And cool, that's fancy and all, Mr. Banting, but in layman's terms, what he's saying is, let's pinch off the pancreas of a dog, allow all parts of it to die except for the eyelets, then let's extract the juices of those eyelets and see if that can fix the dog's sugary urine. In other words, let's see if that can cure the dog of his diabetes. I think my sentence, although less eloquent, is maybe a little bit easier to understand. Let me know in the comments, which of these sentences do you prefer? Banting was so excited by his idea because in his mind, all these other researchers were failing because their process of trying to extract insulin ended up destroying the islets of Langhorns, which means that they were destroying the insulin. And he was so excited to test out his theory, but the issue was he was not a scientist. He was not a researcher. He'd never done that before. He was just some guy born in a small town, Alston, Ontario, Canada. He went to school at the University of Toronto. Then in World War I, he went and became a medical doctor in a military hospital. He came back from the war, opened up a medical practice in London, Ontario, where he practiced surgery and medicine and worked part-time at a local university teaching medicine. He was not a researcher. He didn't know how to research. He didn't have the funds. He didn't know where to access anything. He, he didn't know where to start. So he approached a colleague of his at the University of Western Ontario and his colleague said, hey, there's this guy, John McLeod at the University of Toronto, who's a big deal researcher. He's got tons of facility. He's got lab space. He's got students who are eager to work. Go talk to him, present your idea to him and see if you can use his lab space to research. And so that's what he did. He went up to John McLeod and said, hey, I have this idea. I'm really excited. I think I can find the connection between pancreas and insulin. Can I please use your lab space to do my research? And obviously John McLeod is like, who's this 29 year old hotshot with no experience, thinks he can outdo all these scientists who've been doing it for 30 years and trying to figure out with experience and everything. But he figured, you know what? I have the lab space. I have two young students who are eager to get their feet wet with research. And so let's give him a shot. Let's see what he can do. And as you'll see, that turned out to be a pretty good decision on McLeod's part. So the two students that McLeod wanted to give to Banting were Charles Best and Clark Noble. And both students were supposed to be his lab assistant. They were supposed to trade off day after day. And the boys just flipped a coin to see who would go first. And Charles Best won the coin toss. And so the next day, Charles Best comes in and says, hey, I'm starting today, we flipped a coin. Uh, he's gonna come in tomorrow, I'm gonna come in today and we're gonna rotate. And Banting is like, what? No, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna have a new lab assistant every day. I'm just keeping you for the rest of the summer. And so he kept Charles Best for the rest of the summer. And I think you'll see by the end of the story, that's probably the worst coin toss Clark Noble ever lost in his entire life. So Banting and Best began their experiment. Their experiment was to remove the pancreas out of a dog, try and extract the insulin from that pancreas, and then re-inject it into that dog, which was now suffering from diabetes, to see if they could cure it of that diabetes. But they found it extremely challenging to do proper, true, real scientific research. Shockingly, Cutting edge scientific research is not very easy. And so they asked McLeod for help. And McLeod, just before he went on vacation, gave them some pointers. He showed them how to do this and that, how to properly do certain techniques. And then he went on vacation. And then finally, on July 30th of 1921, Banting and Best were finally successfully able to extract something from a pancreas and re-inject it into a diabetic dog. And they watched the blood sugar of that dog plummet. They'd done it. They'd extracted a crude form of insulin from a pancreas and effectively treated this dog's diabetes. And when McLeod came back from vacation, they were ecstatic. They were so excited to show him what they'd done. And he was like, mm, I'm not impressed because they weren't able to reliably repeat their efforts and their extraction wasn't very pure. And so Banting said, okay, you know what? You're right. The extraction that we got isn't very pure. We need a biochemist to help us purify this insulin to make it as pure as possible. And so that's what they did. They got James Collip on board, a really respected biochemist, and he helped them purify their insulin extraction to a really, really pure form. The group administered their purified pancreas extract into the body of a 13-year-old boy, Leonard Thompson, who was dying of diabetes and didn't have weeks to live. And it worked. It did it. it. It treated him. His urinary and blood sugar went back to normal levels and all of his other diabetes symptoms subsided. It had worked. They did it. They solved this mystery that's been plaguing humanity for thousands of years. This disease that had no cure. That was a death sentence. They had solved it. 
The team eventually added another brilliant chemist, Peter Maloney, to the team, and he was able to take their extraction process and optimize it so that insulin could be mass produced. Now, major companies could mass produce this insulin and get it available to humans all over the world. But the team didn't do this for the money. They wanted to help people. They wanted to solve this problem. And so Banting didn't even put his name on the patent. He famously said, Insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the people. And the rest of his team sold the patent to the University of Toronto for $1 because they did not want to make money off this. This was not a, this was not a money-making scheme. They just wanted to help people. They wanted anyone who needed insulin to have access to it. Now, the way that I've been talking about these guys makes it seem like they were best friends and they were hanging out all the time and stuff, but this was not the case. In fact, Banting hated McLeod and he often fought with Collip. And so when in 1923, the Nobel Prize for the discovery of insulin was only awarded to two of these guys, you bet there was some tension. The Nobel Prize Committee decided to award the Nobel Prize in medicine to Frederick Banting and John McLeod. And Banting was having none of it. He was so mad that Charles Best did not share the award with him. He was going off about how John McLeod didn't do anything and he didn't deserve the award. The day that he received his Nobel Prize, publicly stated, I'm going to give half of my prize money to Charles Best because he deserved to have the award. And then immediately McLeod said, you know what, I'm going to give half my prize money to Collip because he deserved the award. So yeah, it was a big blowout. And actually for, for years, the discovery of insulin was credited to Banting and Best. But over the years, as more of the story has come out, Collip and McLeod have been getting more and more recognition for their part in the discovery of insulin. Now, I think this is a great story about how an accidental discovery led to the lives of tens of millions of people being saved. But clearly, the methods that these scientists were using to extract their insulin was ethically gray. On one hand, it led to the lives of millions of people being saved. But on the other hand, it was at the expense of helpless dogs being needlessly tortured and killed for the sake of scientific advancement. Now, some of you might think that it's worth it. The ends justify the means and that this was an unnecessary thing that needed to happen for human lives to be saved. And other people might think that it was unethical and cruel to these dogs and it shouldn't have been done in the first place and that we should ban laboratory testing on animals. Let me know in the comments below where you stand on this issue. Now, rest assured, the way we make insulin nowadays has nothing to do with dogs. It's actually a really cool technique called recombinant DNA. So what we do is we take the gene that's responsible for producing insulin in humans and we stick it inside of a bacterium. And so we take the bacteria DNA and we kind of slide in this, this gene that's, that's responsible for making human insulin into the bacterial DNA. And then we take these bacteria, we put them into this giant fermentation tank and you just sit there producing insulin and then we extract it. It's so cool. But nowadays there's even a newer technique that scientists are working on where they're using plants, specifically the safflower, and seeing if they can get the plant to produce insulin. And if successful, this would dramatically reduce the cost of insulin production even further. It's so cool. All right, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And if you did, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, hit the share button, ring that bell if you wanna stay up to date when, with whenever I post new videos. Um, but for now, I'll see you in the next one and stay curious, everybody. And if you're curious and you wanna watch more of my videos, you can click on one of these videos here and check out whatever it is they say. All right, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.